In the 1940s, telecommunication systems were relatively young, and the engineers working on those systems were trying to optimize the signal-to-noise ratio of the signals they were transmitting on these systems. From their attempts, they knew that there was a trade-off between the clarity of the sound and the consumed bandwidth. But they didn't know whether this extra bandwidth was really needed or whether they were just not using the available bandwidth in the most efficient way. And that's when Claude Chen came along. Channel would say, here, if you substitute by your channel in this formula here, you will know what the maximum signal-to-noise ratio is. And the engineers rejoiced. Not only because they had an expression for capacity, but also because the expression was computable. This is not always the case. But there was a caveat. The computable expression that Channel discovered was only for so-called memoryless channels. These are channels that don't change from one use to the next. On the other hand, there are also channels with memory, and these are channels that change from one use to the next. So the current output does not depend only on the current input, it also depends on all previous inputs. And in that sense, the channel is escaping memory of the past uses. And for those channels, it was, it was unknown whether capacity was uncomputable or not. And it remained unknown until last year, David Cus and David Perez Garcia came on the scene and showed that capacity for channels with memory is uncomputable. From a computer science perspective, it's almost always fascinating when something turns out to be uncomputable. Because how does this function, for which it's otherwise not obvious that an algorithm cannot exist to compute it, turn out to be uncomputable? From a practical standpoint, uncomputability and undecidability are nice no-go results to have, because if you know that something is uncomputable, you don't have to look for an algorithm to compute it. Suppose you have this channel here, and it's a binary channel, so it takes as input bits and it outputs bits. As every bit passes through the channel, its memory state changes. It becomes a different channel. And you can represent this by this binary state machine. So given a channel memory, you can represent its memory using a finite state machine. Conversely, you can begin with a finite state machine and define a channel on top of it. That's what the Davids did. They said, okay, if we can represent the memory of a channel with memory using a finite state machine, let's go to the automata theory literature and find a finite state machine with an undecidable property and define a channel on top of it. And that's what they did. They went to the automata theory literature, they found this paper, which had this automaton in it, and this automaton has an undecidable property, so then they define a channel on top of it, and boom, they had a channel with uncomputable capacity. So let's go into more detail. Let's consider this finite state machine here. This automaton here has two kinds of states. These double circled states are called accepting states, and these single circled states are called non-accepting states. And these letters here are called the input symbols of the machine, and these trigger the transitions in the machine. So if the automaton is in the state Q1 and it reads the symbol B, it will go to the state Q3. If it's in the state Q1 and it reads the symbol A, it will transition to this block A here. And these transitions are probabilistic, so if it's in the block A and it reads a C, it goes to the state Q2 with probability 1 minus T, and if, it, if it's in A and it reads C, it goes to Q1 with probability T. Strings of these symbols are called words, and the value of the automaton is defined as the supermodel over all words of the probability that the machine is going to begin in this initial state in here and end up in one of these two accepting states. So you can think of it like this. So your goal is to input a string of symbols such that you steer the machine to be in one of these two accepting states. And then the value is the maximum probability that you're going to succeed. And for this particular construction, what's so great about it is that it is undecidable whether the value is one or, or half. And that's what the Davids used to build channel with uncomputable capacity. So they said, okay, here, we're going to begin with this automaton here, and this is going to represent the memory of our channel. Now, on top of this automaton, you can define any channel you want. You could say, for example, I will define the channel to be a bit flip channel if the memory is in the state Q4. And I'm going to define it to be a completely noisy channel if the automaton here is in the state Q6. I'm going to define it to be whatever in this state, and so on and so forth. 
You see, you could define any channel you want. The way that the Vs defined it is as follows, though. They define the channel to be ideal when the automaton is in an accepting state and to be completely noisy when the automaton is in a non-accepting state. For this definition, the capacity of the channel is equal to the value of the automaton. And since it's undecidable whether the value is 1 or half, it's undecidable whether capacity is 1 or half, which implies that capacity is uncomputable to them precision 1 over 4. If you had a computer that could compute capacity to them precision 1 over 4, then that computer would be able to tell you whether capacity is 1 or half. And because that's undecidable, capacity is uncomputable to them precision 1 over 4. And that's how they did it.